if you don't have control over your behavior. You can and very likely will go broke. Just yesterday, this story came out about this guy who lived in a trailer. When he died, he left $4 million to his town. He does not have the pedigree. He does not have the degree from Harvard, but he was clearly patient, not greedy. And because of that, he became very wealthy. In your book, you quote Benjamin Franklin, who once said, if you would persuade, appeal to interest and not to reason. People underestimate the power of incentives. Everyone thinks like, oh, my moral boundaries are right here. But if you had a $6 million bonus dangled in front of your face, you'd be like, oh, maybe I can shift them out a little bit. The biggest risk is what you didn't see coming. Pearl Harbor, September 11th. COVID, the three biggest societal shocks that we've dealt with in America. And the common denominator of all three of those is that nobody, certainly no ordinary Americans, saw those coming until the day that they happened. If we don't know what they're going to be, how can we prepare for these risks? I don't think I've ever told this before, but I'll, I'll tell it here. Yeah, fam, welcome back to the show. And with a podcast name like Young and Profiting, it's no surprise we often talk about the ways we can profit in life on this show. One of the main ways being money. Today, again, we are talking about money, but specifically the psychology and human behavior surrounding money and investing. My guest literally wrote the book on this topic. Morgan Housel is a partner at the Collaborative Fund, and previously he was a columnist at The Motley Fool and The Wall Street Journal. He's a two-time winner of the Best in Business Award from the Society of American Business Editors and Writers, and Market Watch has named him one of the 50 most influential people in markets. His book, The Psychology of Money, was a bestseller, and his brand new book, book is called Same as Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes. Hey, Morgan, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. I am very excited for today's episode. We've been trying to get on this conversation for like a year now. Um, so I'm going to cut straight to the chase. You are a master of many trades. Uh, you're a bestselling author, investor, you're even a podcaster. So how do you define what you do today? It's, a, it's such a good question. I would say I, I don't. I've never tried to put myself in a box. And I think I've, I've moved around over the years. I think if you asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have said, I'm an investor who writes. And mm. maybe if you asked me today, I would say, I'm a writer who invests. Like I've just <laughs> switched around what I enjoy doing. And it used to be that all of my emphasis and research and enjoyment was investing. I want to scour the world and study investing history and whatnot. And I still love that. I'll always do that. But the art of storytelling really kind of bit me 10 or 15 years ago. And that's what I've really find joy in doing now. And that's like, that's the craft that I want to hone. And I think jumping around like that has been really important. If you just put yourself in a box and say, I am a blank, you're, you're, you're cutting off so much of the world that you might find enjoyment in and have some talent in doing. Mm. Now, you're so accomplished. I didn't really have an idea of what you looked like. You look a lot younger than I thought you would be because you've been in this world for such a, a long time. When did you first get interested in finances as a young man? I think I was, I was 19 when I uh, first stumbled across investing. I've told the story before, but it'll, it'll always stick with me. When I was 18, my grandparents gave me $1,000. Um, and I put it in a CD at the bank, certificate of deposit, where it earned interest. And I think I intuitively knew what interest was, but I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't really get it. And I remember I logged into my account the next day, and the balance had grown from $1,000 to $1,000.03. I earned three cents of interest. And I remember <laughs> jaw hitting the floor, being completely stunned that I just earned money for doing nothing. Just for, just for waking up in the morning, somebody paid me. And I, was, I knew at that moment, I was like, this is... This is the thing. This is, this is what I love doing. And so all throughout college, I wanted to be a hedge fund manager or an investment banker. I think in that era, like the mid 2000s, that's what everybody wanted to do uh, in, in, in that field. And then I kind of stumbled haphazardly across writing. It was never part mm. of the plan. I never wanted to become a writer. And even when I started doing it, I was a, a senior in college when I got a job at The Motley Fool as a, writing about stocks. And I didn't want to do it. Like I just needed a job. And, um, but I fell in love with it. So I think that in itself is a lesson of like, particularly for people in college, you think you, you might think you know what you want to do and you have a goal and you have a path in front of you, but so many people, including myself, probably you stumble into what they actually love and want to do serendipitously. And yeah. so I think it was great that I, I did not follow the path that I thought I had paved for myself and just stumbled into something else. 
Yeah. And it sounds like you had an open mind to explore different skills and see what you were good at. And then then you were able to merge finance and writing, which you didn't expect to actually do, into a career as an author, a best-selling author at that. So, Well, here, well here's what's really interesting about it. I, I would not say I had an open mind about it. I graduated mm. college in 2008 when the world was on fire and everything was burning down. The economy, like no one in finance was hiring. Everybody was laying people off. So I found a job at The Motley Fool as a writer, and I took it because I had, to, I, had, I had rent to pay. That was why I took it. I didn't do it because I was like, oh, maybe I like writing. That'll be fun. I took it because I was like, I need a, I need a paycheck today. And, if, mm. and they were the, like the only people in finance who were hiring. And so for the first six months, I, not only did I not really like it, I was kind of ashamed of it. I was like, I want to mm. be a hedge fund manager, and now I'm a blogger? Like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but it took, like, after about a year, I started to really enjoy it and just love the craft of writing. Yeah. And that makes sense because usually when you're not, if you don't have experience, you're bad at that thing. And then you feel demotivated because you're not that good at it. But over time, if you get better, you can enjoy it and, and find motivation, I'm sure, in what you're doing. I think if there's one thing that has really helped me in my career, it's a combination of for the first two or three years, I had to do that job because nobody else mm. was hiring. And then after that, I think I've just been stubborn. I don't know if it's patience or stubbornness or a mix of the two. But <laughs> But I, I've, been, I've been writing about behavioral finance every day for 17 years. And if you do it, for, if you do anything for that long, you'll gain some proficiency, no matter what it is. Anybody mm. in any field, if they do it every day for 20 years, will get good at it. And yeah. so I think that's, that's been just like sticking with it has been what's, what's helped me the most. Yeah. And I think something that also changed the way that you think about the world is actually an accident that happened when you were younger on ski slopes. Um, it really probably severely impacted you. It's really, really traumatic and tragic what happened. Can you tell us about that and how it shaped the way that you view the world? Yeah. So I grew up as a competitive ski racer in Lake Tahoe, California. I was on the Squaw Valley ski team and that was my my life for my childhood and my teenage years. Um, skied six days a week, 10 months a year, all over the world racing. It was great. It was like such a cool experience. And there were about 12 of us on the Squaw Valley ski team. And we were all best friends. We had been together since we were children, skiing mm. six days a week all over the world. And so one day in, uh, in February of 2001, I was 17 years old and I was skiing with my two best friends who we had grown up together. They were 17 as well. And we would ski down the backside of Squaw Valley which is out of bounds, which you're not supposed to do. You duck under mm. the ropes that say do not cross. But we did this because we were young and rebellious. And that's where the best skiing is. It's untracked. You have the place to yourself. Now, when you ski out of bounds like that, when you get to the bottom, there's no chairlift because you're, you went out of bounds. So mm. it would spit us out on this backcountry road and we would hitchhike back. And so we, we loved doing this. It was kind of a thrill. Like we got to hitchhike. It was all just a very rebellious thing that 17-year-olds do. Mm. So, so the three of us ski this run. And as we're skiing down, I very vividly remember we triggered a small avalanche. And it's like, it's a feeling that you will never forget because rather than pushing on the ground with your skis to gain traction and control, all of a sudden the ground is pushing you. And avalanches are very powerful. So all of a sudden you'll be skiing down and then all of a sudden you have no control and it'll push you 20 feet this way and then jolt you 30 feet that way. But it was pretty small and it ended. Uh, pretty quickly. And the three of us ski down and we like high fived about it at the bottom. We were like, Whoa, did you see that avalanche? It was so cool. We hitchhiked back and Brendan and Brian, my two friends who were with me. They said, Hey, let's do it again. That was great. Let's go ski that run again. Mm. For whatever reason, I, I don't really know. I said, I don't want to do it again, but how about this? How about you guys go do it again? And rather than hitchhiking back, I'll drive around to the to the side of the mountain and I'll pick you up in my truck so you don't have to hitchhike. Mm. They said, great, let's do it. We made that plan. We went our separate ways. They went skiing. I went back to get my truck to go get them. 20 minutes later, I drive around to meet them at like the pickup spot where I was going to meet them and they weren't there. And I really didn't think anything of it. I didn't, I, I thought that they had priority already hitchhiked back. They, uh, maybe mm. I was late. I didn't, it didn't, it didn't really bother me. And I went back to our locker room where I expected to find them and they were not there either. And nobody had, nobody had seen them. Mm. And st at that point, I started to wonder what happened, but I really wasn't worried at that point. Uh, several hours later, Brian's mom called me at home and she said, hey, Brian didn't show up for work today. Do you know where he is? And I told her the truth. I said, yeah, we skied down the backside out of bounds and I was going to pick them up, but they never showed up. And I think at that moment, Aww. she and I like pieced together what probably happened here. And then so 
Uh, later that day, several hours later, we got the police involved, missing persons report. They eventually we had turned into, we got search and rescue involved. Search and rescue went on the hill at about midnight to start looking for them. They had these giant portable floodlights and a team of search dogs, search and rescue dogs. And then later the next morning, after about nine hours of searching, uh, when the search and rescue workers got to the area, the out of bounds area where I told them we'd skied, they said it looked like half the mountain had been torn away from what was clearly a very fresh, just massive, enormous avalanche. And avalanches can be the equivalent of like a tsunami, just unbelievable amount of power. They can snap mm. giant trees with their force. And it had clearly just been a massive avalanche here. The search dogs eventually homed in on a spot in the avalanche field where rescuers who had these giant pro poles found Brennan and Brian uh, dead in the avalanche. They were buried about six feet under. And so, of course, I always have to say when I tell this story, like, I think you and everyone else listening has, has lost somebody dear to them. It's not unique in that sense. I don't want to pretend like it was unique that I had a friend who died. Most people have experienced something, some version of that. But of course, it had, a, it had a really profound impact on me. And one of the reasons why, and it took me a while to really piece this together, was if I had gone with them on that second run, 100% chance I would be dead. It was such a massive, it took out everything in its path. And so then I look back on it and it's like the most important decision that I ever made in my life by far was not going on the second run. And I didn't put any thought into that decision. I didn't weigh the, I didn't weigh the pros and cons. I didn't do a risk analysis. It was just a brainless, dumb decision. Why don't you guys go do it? I'll, I'll do something else. And nothing in my life has mattered more. And I think a lot of things in life are like that, where in hindsight and only in hindsight, do you look back and you're like the, the worst or the best thing that ever happened to me came about because of this dumb brainless decision. And maybe people listening to this today, if you left your house for work at 8.53 instead of 8.54, you may have died in a car accident. You know, I'm, I'm making this up, but there's all these just random, you, like, you understand how the world hangs by a thread yeah. of, of these decisions. And when you come to terms with that, I think it makes you much more humble in your ability ability and willingness to predict what's going to happen in the future. When you see how fragile it is, you just realize you have no idea what's coming next. Yeah. And so you accomplished a lot at a young age. Like I said, I hopped on the call and was like, just, you know, so most people I interview are like 50, 60 years old or whatever. You don't seem, seem you're definitely not that old. Right. So you accomplished a lot in your life. Do you feel like it's because you had this experience at 17 years old, losing your two best friends and, and realizing like how fragile life is, like you better get at it calling all dog owners. When your dog truly loves their food, you can tell from a peppy step to a healthy coat, your dog feels their best when they're eating well. That's why you should switch to Nom Nom. <coughs> Nom Nom delivers freshly made dog food straight to your door. Every portion is personalized to your dog's needs with real wholesome ingredients that you can see and recognize. Their nutrient-packed recipes are designed by board-certified veterinary nutritionists without any additives or fillers that contribute to bloating and low energy. I had a dog that recently passed away. His name was Bam Bam, and he died at 16 years old. And he lived a long time because my mother used to cook him homemade food his entire life. And so he became a very picky eater. He would only eat homemade food. And as he became an older dog, he was very healthy. But Towards the last couple of years, I needed to help out more. And when he'd stay with me, I didn't have time to cook a homemade meal for me, let alone Bam Bam. So I tried Nom Nom and it was great. It was healthy. It was even healthier than homemade cooked food because they put the right vitamins that is needed for a senior dog. You know, it wasn't just like chicken and rice and whatever was in the cupboard. And Nom Nom is trusted by so many other dog owners. Over 40 million meals go to good dogs like yours and mine, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail wags. Plus, Nom Nom comes with the money-back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Go right now for 50% off your no-risk two-week trial at trynom.com slash profiting. Spelled trynom.com slash profiting for 50% off. That's trynom.com slash profiting. I think that would be a small part of it. I think in a broader sense, ski racing was so important because we were independent and treated as adults since we were like 14. 
and we would we would travel around with the coaches skiing, but like the coaches, like God bless them, would just go to bars, and then like we were out being adults for better mm. or worse. But I think that created an incredible sense of independence and like forced you to grow up very fast. That had a big impact on me. But certainly losing my friends at that age made me realize how fragile life can yeah. be. And like that's, I, I think my my perception of risk changed dramatically after that. And after that, it was like, I, I, I would not take risks that I would have before that because you see the consequences of your actions. Well, yeah, when you're that young, it's inevitable. Like a lot of people at like 18, 19, 20, like that's when you're doing like the most drugs and like all this kind of stuff because you just think you're invincible. So I have a feeling you probably didn't really do much of that at all. I was, I, I think even before that happened, I was always kind of, uh, you know, I had, I had friends who were doing it more than I, I'm not, I'm not going to mm. sit here and say I, I did none of it, but there were definitely, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll give you a specific example. I was telling my wife the other day, I remember when I was 18, one of my friends had cocaine and I was mm -hmm. like, absolutely not. Like not mm -hmm. even in the slightest in a million years would I touch that stuff. Never. But all my other friends are like, yeah, let's give it a whirl. Let's, let's see how this works. Yeah. So even at that age, I think just naturally I was like, never, I, I had, I had a risk assessment that was different from my friends. Yeah. Mm. So you worked at Motley Fool, like you were saying, you got a job right out of college at Motley Fool. And you actually thought you were going to stay there and work there forever. You bought a house near the headquarters and you thought you'd never leave. So what actually changed your mind to pivot your career a bit? Yeah, it was one of the, the hardest decisions of my career because I was really happy and comfortable at the Motley Fool. It's a great place to work, still is, filled with great people. I was happy there. Got in Craig Shapiro, who runs a private equity firm called The Collaborative Fund reached out to me in 2015. And he just said, hey, I like your work. Why don't you come to Collaborative Fund and just keep doing it? Keep doing exactly what you're doing, but just do it here. And I said, hey, I, I'm flattered, but I'm really happy here. No, thanks. My wife and I had just had our first kid who was like two months old at the time. I was, I, I was not prepared to just like throw my career upside down. But he kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And I think that I think what it, the decision for me eventually became was, if I stay at The Motley Fool forever, from, from the time I was in college until I retire in my 60s, will I regret never trying something different? And mm -hmm. I think after a while, I realized that the answer was, was yeah, I think I might, you know, wonder what else was out there. So I, I finally joined Collaborative Fund in 2016. And it's, it's, been, it's been amazing. You know, that was before I had written books or done anything like that. And Craig was one of the, the only people I think in the world who would say, Morgan, just go do your thing. I'm not going to tell you what to write or when to write or and like any, and I don't write about what collaborative fund does. I just, I feel like it's mm. just my own canvas to write about anything that I'm interested in. And so that was a really rare opportunity. Almost every professional writer at an organization, if you write for the Wall Street Journal or Reuters or CNN or something, you have an editor telling you what to write, how to write it, when to turn it in. And I think that just strips away the art of writing. It just turns it mm. into a, a job instead of an art. So I, I really enjoy the artistic side of it. At what point did you decide like, hey, I want to write actual books, not just for a blog? Like, was that a conscious decision or was that when you went to this new fund, they told you like, hey, we want you to write books? No, definitely not the latter. And it was a conscious mm. decision for a long time to not write books. I never saw the point in it. And I would always say like, look, I, I blog twice a week why does it matter if it's stuffed in between two pieces of cardboard? It's the same thing. Mm. It's the same words. Like I'm not, I'm still writing. So who cares? And I, so that was why I pushed off writing books for years. And I had been like a publisher um, came to me in 2014, maybe 2013 and said, Hey, like we want you to write a book. And I was absolutely not. I'm not ready. Like I don't want to do it. It sounds hard. And so in hindsight, I'm so glad that I waited because I became a better writer. I had more content to use for the books. So the fact that I was so stubborn about doing it, it was so beneficial to me. And it mm. wasn't in 2018, I wrote a very long blog post called The Psychology of Money. And it was like, it was a 10,000 word blog post, which is very, very long. Most books are about 50,000 words. So it was one fifth mm. of a book in a blog. And, um, that it, it was it was the biggest blog post that I had ever written. It it did really well. It was well received. And so that was when I was like, oh, people like this style and format and this substance. And like it's not going to take me that much effort to expand what I already have into a book. And so that was when it was like, okay, like I I'm finally gonna do this. My wife had had convinced me. I don't think I've ever told this story before, but I'll I'll tell it here. Yeah, tell um, me. 
an author named James Clear who wrote a book called Atomic mm. Habits. It's it's the best yeah. selling and one of the best books of the last generation. It's just an absolute gem of a book. Mm-hmm. And um, he published his book in 2018. And uh, I think it was seeing the success of Atomic Habits that I was like, I, I want that. It was not jealousy. It was not envy. It was motivation. I was like, what James has, I, I want to chase it. And James, as you will see when he comes on, is the nicest, most humble, politest guy you'll ever meet. So the fact that not only had James had success in a book, but I was like, I want to be James. I'm not like, not just his success. <laughs> I want to be him. Was like a, a big motivator for me to be like, okay, like I really want to write a book now. And James and I have become friends since then. It's, it's awesome. Oh, I love that. It's actually, it's actually interesting. In the summer of 2018, uh, I was at in Omaha, Nebraska for the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting. And we rented a house with like 10 friends. And this random guy came over to have dinner. I don't know who invited him, but I had no, who, no idea who he was. And, we, and he introduced himself. He said, hi, I'm James Clear. I'm writing a book called Atomic Habits. It's going to come out in a couple months. And so we had, no, we had no idea, but like in hindsight, looking back, it's so funny to piece all that together. Yeah, that book is huge. Like I think to this day, it's still like on all the bestseller lists. So like you were saying, you wanted to become an author because you saw the opportunity and you were like, I want what James Clear has. How has being an author actually transformed your career? Like what opportunities have come about? I'm sure you weren't doing podcast. I mean, I'm not positive, but I'm sure you like weren't doing podcasts be- like before you had a book. Is that right? I- I'd say... <sighs> In some ways, nothing has changed. In some ways, everything has changed. Nothing has changed because I still write about the same topics. I still read the same topics. I still sit in the same chair and think the same way. (laughs) My my wife and kids don't treat me any differently. Like in 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 most ways, nothing has changed. What the book did to me, and it's it's a very real thing, is it gave me independence, which is Mm. a big topic in psychology of money. Like what you want to use money and wealth for is to gain control over your time. Yep. And like, if I'm being honest with you, I feel like I'm, I'm really opening myself up in this podcast here. If I'm honest, before the book, I had, I was always filled with career anxiety. What happens if I get laid off? What happens if this doesn't work? And it really scared mm. me, particularly as I became a father. It was like, I mean, I got, I got mouths to feed. What happens if this doesn't work? And I, I think that's the one thing that's changed post books is like a greater sense of financial independence that it means the world to me. And I also, my, my wife has pointed this out too. I think I've been in a better mental state post books than I have in my life because I think it, it didn't make me happier, but I think it removed anxiety from my life. And yeah. that is, it's interesting that that was in a way that was what the book was about. But then because of writing the book, I got to experience it myself, which has been, it's, it's a cool thing. And why do you think that freedom has come about? Is it because you're getting like speaking engagements that so you're like pulling in extra revenue streams? Obviously book sales has some revenue streams, but book sales these days don't really move the needle, right? Maybe your books do, but wh- what do you think changed in terms of you feeling like you have more freedom? It's, it's all the above. It's, it's book royalties, it's speaking, it's all the above. And we haven't mm. really changed our lifestyle to any meaningful degree. We live in the same yeah. house and drive the same car and whatnot. And so a lot of that is just accrued to net worth. And, and that's mm-hmm. what, this is what I write about in psychology money too. Like wealth is what you don't see. It's not yeah. the cars that you buy. It's not the house that you buy. Wealth is the money that you saved that gives you independence, that mm. allows you to do whatever the heck you want to do. And so that's what it's been for us. It's like we've saved the vast, vast majority of it. And because of that, the anxiety that I had of what if back then has largely been, has largely been stripped away. Now, you will never yeah. get rid of what if because what if you get hit by a car? What, what if you get hit? You're, you're never going to remove risk. But a lot of the tangible career risks that I had five years ago has, has dissipated. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so your book, Psychology of Money, Psychology of Money, came out in 2020. It was a huge hit. And you say in the book that money has little to do with how smart you are and a lot to do with how you behave. So let's start there. I think it's a good foundation of the book. Can you shed some more color on that and give us examples of how behavior can actually trump smarts? Well, here's how I always define it. If you are the smartest financial mind in the world, you have a PhD in finance from Harvard. You know all the numbers. You won the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics. But you don't have control over your behavior. You don't have a control over your greed and fear or patience or temper. You can and very likely will go broke. Mm-hmm. And the flip side of that is if you have no financial education, you don't know anything. You didn't graduate high school. You're a country bumpkin who knows nothing. But you do have control over your 
greed and fear and patience and temper. You can, you have everything you need to become wealthy. And there are so many, just, just yesterday, there was a news story that came out about this guy who lived in the middle of I don't know, West Virginia or something like that and lived in a trailer and mm-hmm. he just he recently this. died and he left $4 million to his town that yeah. he, because that's the perfect example. He does not have the pedigree. He does not have the degree from Harvard. He did not work at Goldman Sachs, but he was clearly patient, not greedy, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, he became very wealthy. Mm. And so there are very few fields in which that's the case. Like, like if you, if you did not go to medical school, you do not know how to perform open heart surgery, full stop. But, in, but it's not like that in finance. And um, you, know, you don't need the education to do well as long as you have the behaviors. Mm. So because it's one of the few fields that's like that, it's easy to overlook like what you need. And most people, if they're like, I want to become a good investor, they're like, great, I'm, I'm going to go get a degree in finance. I'm going to go work. I'm going to like memorize all the formulas. And by and large, like, no, no, that's not what you need. What you need is the behavior. Now, for a lot of people, that behavior is, is uh, nature instead of nurture. Like they're born understanding. Their, their brain mm. is wired in a way that lets them do it. And some people are the opposite of that. But just understanding what you need and what you don't is, I think, the most important thing of, of doing well with money. Yeah. And just to dig in on what you said, you also say in your book that we learn traditionally about finance, like it's physics, right? It's rules, there's laws, but you say we should look at it more like psychology with emotion and nuance. Can you dig deeper on that? When I started my LinkedIn masterclass, I wanted to focus on what I do best, which is marketing and teaching. When it came to things like building a website and collecting payments, I didn't know where to start. And frankly, I didn't want to spend my energy on those things. That's why I'm so glad I found Shopify. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide, just like mine. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run, and grow your business without any struggle. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're pushing designer t-shirts from their in-person POS system or monetizing masterclasses like me on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you're covered. Setting up my Shopify store just took a day or two, and in less than a year, I've made well over $300,000 with my LinkedIn Secrets Masterclass. Shopify is a platform I log on to daily during promotional periods for my class. My favorite thing to do is to put up a social post on LinkedIn, and then I check my analytics in the live view on Shopify right away and I can see how many people are logged on, how many people added to cart, how many people are checking out. It is so exhilarating. It is such a dopamine rush and it's rewarding to see all of my hard work in action in their live view. Once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn browsers into buyers. Shopify helps me close more sales by giving me the ability to easily do things like retarget abandoned carts, give discount promo codes, set up referral programs and subscriptions. And I was even able to implement a chat function within just minutes to answer questions my future students had about class. It's no wonder Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US and Shopify is truly a global force powering companies like Allbirds, Rothy's and Brooklyn and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 100 and 70 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month free trial period at shopify.com slash holla, and that's all lowercase. Make sure you type it in correctly. That's H-A-L-A, shopify.com slash holla to take your business to the next level. Again, for a $1 per month trial period, go to shopify.com slash holla, H-A-L-A, and that's all lowercase. Yeah, I think like in, in math and in physics, there's one right answer for everybody. So if I say like, what is two plus two? It's four, no matter who you are or where you're from or where you live or how old you are. Mm. But in finance, it's not like that. Because if I say, how should you invest your money? Well, what works for me might be different, might not work for you and vice versa. And what works for me, like everyone listening, we're all going to come to a different conclusion because our risk tolerance is different. Our social aspirations are different. Our, our, our time horizons are different. Everything is different. So it's much closer to like, like a taste in music. And if mm. I said like, what's the best music? It's like, well, there's no, there's no one answer for that. It just depends who you are and what you like and how old you are. Music that I liked when I was 15 would be atrocious to me now. So you're going to change throughout time. 
And so that's, that's most of the nuance in finance is just realizing that there is not one right answer. And I think the majority of the time in finance, when people are arguing with each other about how should you spend your money? How should you invest your money? They're not actually arguing. They're not actually debating. It's just people with different experiences and different risk tolerances talking over each other. Mm -hmm. And it's the equivalent that like, if I think X and X is good for me, you might think X is terrible because it, it would be bad for you. That's, that's the biggest issue with like financial debates. Yeah. So this reminds me of something that you were just mentioning, the fact that you and your wife have basically stayed at the same like goalpost all these years. You know, you drive the same car, you live in the same house, you haven't really increased uh, the amount of money that it costs to live your life, but you've both increased your income. So you're able to save more. I guess, talk to us about this, this importance of knowing what your own goalpost is and why that matters. The first thing I think is important is like we, we live a great life. We, we, we live in a great house in a great neighborhood and we take great vacations. We are not the kind of people who are like, 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 like the guy who's living in the trailer and is like leaving all this money. Like there, there is obviously some balance to it. But I think the idea that if your expectations grow faster than your income, you will never, ever be happy with your money is one of the most important and powerful realizations in finance. That there are hedge fund managers who make $100 million a year and feel like they're falling behind because their buddies make 200 million a year. Like there mm. is no cap to that. And, you know, maybe, you know, Elon Musk displaced Jeff Bezos as the richest man in the world. I, I don't know this to be the case, but maybe that bothered Jeff Bezos because he's now, now he's only worth a quarter of a trillion dollars while Musk was worth a third of a trillion dollars. Like there's no end to financial comparison. And so, yes, it's important if you want to do well with money to grow your income, invest your money, grow your net worth. But it is equally important and very easy to overlook that you also need to go out of your way to manage your expectations yeah. and just be, just be happy with what you have, knowing that if you get the bigger house or the nicer car, it's going to feel cool for like four minutes and then you're yeah. going to get used to it and it's not going to feel any different. And so look, we live in a, a nice house in a safe neighborhood, all of that checks all the boxes, but there is this thing of just like, yeah, but if we got a bigger house we wouldn't be any happier. And we might actually like spoil the expectations of our kids who think that that bigger house is now the norm. So it's, this is something that like we always battle with because even for us who believe this and live it, the expectation of like, ah, oh, maybe we should get a Range Rover. It's like, it's always there. Like that mm -hmm. feeling, that drive is always there. Um, but then just taking a step back and be like, well, is, is there something else we could do with our money? Like would, have, would the vacation make us happier? Would donating it make us happier? is like that battle is always there. But whenever we've experienced it, and when you go out of your way to keep your expectations low too, then your drive for a better life moves away from what's the next car, what's the next house towards like, actually what makes us happier is spending more time with our kids mm. and spending more time with my wife, like going for walks with my wife. So like, hey, can we use our money to do that? To actually like use our money to free up our time so that we can spend more time with our kids and with each other? Because that's definitely going to make us happier but the Range Rover probably won't. That's that's the debate that we always have in our heads. Yeah, and you know, as I get older and make more money, I feel like I'm actually becoming smarter about the way that I spend my money because I realize like how much I have to work for a certain amount of things. Uh, this reminds me, I, it was Thanksgiving, so I saw my family and my sister-in-law has never worked a day in her life just carrying a $6,000 bag. Meanwhile, my company made $5 million last year and my most expensive bag is like $3,000. So I was, I saw her and I'm like, just, it made me realize like how much different people's priorities are and how people like spend their money and, and manage their money is so varied in terms of what people believe like success looks like. And in terms of like how much they want to save and, and all the, it's so, so varied across the spectrum. It's so varied. And this is one thing that I've kind of tweaked my views on in the last couple of years is that the $6,000 bag for your sister-in-law, maybe that's, maybe that is the best use of her money. Yeah. Maybe it's not, but for some people it would be, even if for my wife and I, or maybe you, it would not be to each their own. And there are a lot of people who will look at how my wife and I spend our money, particularly the few mm -hmm. of our friends who would know our income and then look at how we spend it would be like, what are you guys doing? Like what you are yeah. missing out on so much. And I, no, I don't think we are. I think, I think we're pretty cognizant of what we're doing and how we spend it. And we're doing the best, the best 
thing for us, which to me, all that matters. Like I've never wanted to become the mansion Lamborghini guy. I've always wanted to become the independent guy who can just do whatever he wants any day. And no one's going to tell me what to do or when to do it. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not like a, like I reject all authority kind of guy. I'm not like a hardcore libertarian, but for money stuff, like for work stuff, I'm going to have the most fun and do the best work if it's on my own terms. So the fact that I can write what I want, when I want, and the reason I can do that is because I have some sense of financial independence. I don't need to work for the salaried company has been like, that is the best use of money for me by far. Yeah. So I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the purpose of money. You've been alluding to it, but talk to us about why independence and autonomy is really the, the purpose of gaining wealth. I think back to what we said of everyone's different and maybe the $6,000 handbag is right for you, but not for me. But mm -hmm. if there is one common denominator of which almost everybody from every culture and every age is going to get benefit from, it's independence. Like people do not by and large, do not enjoy being told when to work, how to work, and what work to do. They do that because they have to. They have to, they need the paycheck, and that's the way to do it. But when most people get the first taste of independence they have, they're like, oh, that's, that's good. That's the one I like. And even if you are working for a salaried company, if you have a boss and in a position that gives you independence and autonomy, not only is it more enjoyable, you're going to do better work the quality of your work is going to go up if you're doing it on your own terms. Mm. And so it's such a universal driver of happiness. And maybe, and maybe that's actually the wrong word because independence doesn't necessarily make you happy, but it removes unhappiness, which is like, mm. that's an important nuance, but it's really important. People who are wealthier by and large do not wake up happier, like happy in the sense that like they wake up smiling every morning. It's not that, but I think they have fewer bad days. And that is a huge life advantage to, to remove uncertainty and misery from your life is, is massive. So mm. just because I think it is it's one of the few things in money that tends to be universal. And it's also very easy to overlook because particularly for young people and particularly young men, the knee-jerk reaction of why do you want to become rich is so I can have nice stuff, so I can have a big house and a fancy car. But And it's easy to overlook what's actually going to bring you the most joy is using it to give yourself independence. Mm, I love that. So let's talk about emotions and money. What are some of the common emotional pitfalls that a lot of us fall under when it comes to handling our finances? I mean, the two biggest that come to mind, one from personal finance and one from investing. In personal finance, it's social comparison. And there is no such thing as an objective measure of wealth. Everything is just relative to what other people have. So mm. you, look at, you look at your house, your car, your bank account, and you say, what do I have compared to that person? And that person is usually your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, but also just people on social media. And then, and then because of that, like that is the fuel to move the goalpost. Because even if you are doing well, you're going to start looking at people who are doing better than you, and you're always going to feel inadequate. And it's very hard to break that cycle. Social media makes this so ridiculously difficult. Because now the people who you are comparing yourself to is like the curated algorithmic reel on TikTok and Instagram that knows exactly what's going to make you anxious. They know exactly which posts are going to make you feel inadequate because that's what's mm -hmm. going to get you to stare at it the longest and be like, why don't I have what he or she has? So that's, that's like a really difficult trap to break. In investing, the pitfall is FOMO. It's fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. You look at other people getting rich and you're like, I mean, it's, it's, it's similar to social comparison. That person is getting richer than me and therefore I need to take more risks or try to copy that person in, in, able, in order to catch up to him. And the danger in that is that just like in gambling, everyone on social media talks about their wins, never their losses. So the people who look like they are getting so much richer than you, A, probably are not. <laughs> like yeah. It's probably some sort of mirage. But because you don't know that, you're going to start taking risks that you shouldn't and can't afford to take. I mean, this in 2021, when there was like the Robin Hood explosion in mm -hmm. investing was so, it just like, it went supernova at that point because you had all these like 19 year old people who are like, I just made $20,000 on Robin Hood and you should be able to double your money every week. A, most of that was bullshit. And B, the people who looked at that said, I need to go start trading options too. And you know how that ended. For the vast majority of them, it ended in tears and, and mm -hmm. losses. 
And so all of that is driven by FOMO, the idea that someone else is getting richer than you and you need to catch up. And so if you can break away from that and realize that there are always people who are either look like or actually are getting richer than you, and that's fine. That's totally fine. It's unavoidable. You don't need to catch them. You just need to play your own game and do what works for you is really important. Yeah. I feel like everything you're saying is reminding me of this bag story from yesterday. That's kind of why I brought it up is because at first I felt bad. I was like, man, she's got a $6,000 bag. Like I work so hard. I don't have a $6,000 bag. And then I realized, well, I could have a $6,000 bag. I'm just, this, these are just not my priorities. So to your point, everybody has different goalposts. And just because somebody looks like they have a lot of money doesn't mean like behind the curtain that they actually have much going on at all. And I would, I would actually take it a step further with nothing to do with your sister-in-law. I'm just yeah, nothing. A general, I love my a, a, sister-in-law, but it's just, I'm, that's I'm just sure, yeah, I'm, it's I'm just sure she's example. wonderful. Yeah. But when you see somebody driving a hundred thousand dollar car, the only thing you know about their finances is that they have a hundred thousand dollars less mm-hmm. than they did before they bought the car. You have no idea how much money they have. And I learned about this when I was in college, I was a valet at a, at a nice hotel in Los Angeles. And you would, these people would come in driving Porsches and Ferraris and Lamborghinis. And then if you get to know them and talk to them, you realize they're actually not that successful. They just spent like half of their salary on a Lamborghini lease payment. And then so like the, the vision that they had, the identity of like, oh, this guy's driving a Lambo. He's clearly super successful. Like, no, you actually don't know that at all. And it's the classic millionaire next door of like a lot of the people who are very successful are actually driving F-150s. They're actually driving like... Toyota 4Runners. And you yeah. would never know it because that's why they're rich. It's because they actually invested their money instead of spending it on a car they couldn't afford. Yeah, I love it. So related to this, you say that keeping money and getting money are two very different skills. You actually say that if you could summarize money success in a single word, it would be survival. So talk to us about how we can actually keep our money and the main ways that people tend to lose their wealth. It's just this idea that there are, you know, Getting rich and staying rich are two different skills, and they're often conflicting skills, which means it's hard for people to do them at the same time. Getting rich requires taking a risk, being optimistic about yourself, being optimistic about the economy and the stock market. That's what you need to get rich. And staying rich is almost like the exact opposite. It requires you have to be a little bit paranoid, a little bit conservative, kind of scared of risk, cognizant of risk, in order to make sure that you're not taking big enough risks to throw yourself over the edge. And so I think one way to summarize it is save your money like a pessimist and invest your money like an optimist. Save your money with the idea that the world is risky and dangerous and fragile. And there are always recessions and bear markets and pandemics and terrorist attacks and wars and political mess ups that you need to be able to endure financially. Mm. But if you can, if you can like keep your head on straight during those periods, the rewards for those who stick around are incredible. Like I've been investing for 20 years, 2004 is about when I started investing. During that time, there has never been a single moment in which you couldn't point to a dozen things going catastrophically wrong in the economy. It was always at every single moment, stock market's overvalued. Companies aren't doing very well. Unemployment's too high. Inflation's too high. Interest rates are too low. At any moment, you could have pointed to a dozen things. And during those 20 years, the stock market is up fourfold. And I think that like that's how investing works. It's you have to save like a pessimist to endure all of those dozen things to point at. But Mm -hmm. if you can stick around, you look back over a 20 year period and you're like, man, I made four times my money during this period. It's incredible. That's always how it works. So like saving like a pessimist, investing like an optimist. Yeah. And I know that you are a strong proponent of having patience. And in your book, you've got a chapter called Tales You Win. And you talk about how sometimes it's that one Picasso painting that an art investor acquires that makes up for all the ones that they don't. So can you give us some examples of long tail strategy and why that's important? Yeah. So the, the painting, the painting example is one that I love. It's there were all these art collectors back, um, you know, in, in the last 50 years and a disproportionate, like a, a very small number of families ended up with these ridiculous art portfolios. They had Picasso's and Monet's and like Renoir, like all these, like the top paintings ended up in the hands of very few number of people. So look back and they're like, how did those art collectors know what was going to become valuable? Because when Picasso was alive and painting, he was not the Picasso who he is today. Like most mm. artists become famous after they die. So then they're like, how did these people know what was going to be big? And they pieced, they looked at their art portfolio. And the explanation was, 
those collectors did not know who was going to be big. What they did is you had a couple of collectors would go out and buy every painting they could possibly get their hands off of. If any painting was for sale, they scooped it up. And they ended up with like thousands or tens of thousands of paintings. And within that portfolio ended up by chance, some Picassos and some Monets and some Renoirs, mm. but they didn't know in hindsight what it was going to be. Or in with foresight, they didn't know. It was only in hindsight that because they collected so many, a couple of them ended up being worth a zillion dollars. And mm. investing is exactly the same. Like you have no idea which companies are going to be the next, te next Tesla, the next Apple, the next Amazon. Nobody knows. And people who say they do know are, are, are pulling your, are, 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 are fooling you. But if you, if you own an index fund that owns 3000 companies in it, then you know that whatever is going to be the next Tesla is in there, whatever it might be. And so that's like always in investing. If you own an index of a hundred companies over a 10 year period, you're going to own, earn most of your returns from five of them. Like a very mm -hmm. small portion is going to return most of them. And since you don't know what those five are going to be with foresight, the best, the best idea is just own all of them, knowing full well that whatever is going to be the winner is going to be in your portfolio. And that's why you have the statistics about what percentage of active stock pickers outperform index funds. It's very, very low, particularly if you adjust it for fees and for taxes. Over a 10 or 20 year period, it rounds to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren Buffett recently said that in his life, he's met 10 people who he thinks can consistently outperform the stock market, consistently pick the right stocks. 10 people that he's ever met in his entire life. And uh, everyone listening to this podcast, you, you are not one of them. I'm sorry yeah, to say. Good luck. <laughs> and so that, I think that's the, the only anecdote to that. And it's the easiest, cheapest anecdote to that is index investing. It's just own all of them knowing that you're going to have the winners in there. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Warren Buffett, in your book, you say if he had retired at 60 years old, he might not be the Warren Buffett that we know today. That's like such like everybody thinks of him as like the most successful investor is because he's been investing for, you know, whatever it is, 60 years or whatever it's been. Yeah, if you look at his his net worth, he's 99% of his of his net worth was accumulated after his 60th birthday. So he's mm -hmm. 93, I think he is now. And 99% of that money came after he was 60, which means that if he had retired when he was 60, like a normal person may have, if he was a billionaire when he was 60, you would have never heard of him. The whole reason he's so successful and the whole reason he's now a household name is because he's been, yes, he is a good investor, but the secret is that he's been a good investor for 80 years. And it's just the amount of time he's been doing it for that generates all of that money. He also yeah. started investing when he was 11 years old. So oh, wow. like that's, that's why he's so successful because he's been doing it nonstop from 11 to 93. And like, that's, that's actually the biggest takeaway that ordinary people can take from him because I, and, and you and anyone else cannot pick stocks like Warren Buffett, but can we try to emulate his patience? Can we like, can like, is that something that we could maybe copy from him? It's, it's, it's a much more, you have a fighting chance of replicating his patience than you do a replicating his intelligence. Mm. And so that's, I think, just understanding why he's wealthy and using that as a takeaway of what we can do and copy him at is, is really important. Yeah. So this is a concept that I think is from your next book that we're going to talk about. But what we're talking about is reminding me of this. So I know that you actually don't really pay attention to daily news when it comes to changing your your stock strategy or picking your stocks. You don't like just follow like here's something's hot and then buy it. Right. So talk to us about how you actually decide what stocks you're going to invest in for the long term. Well, uh, to, to the, your last point, I, I keep it as simple as I can. I own Vanguard index funds and it's, it's all I've owned for a long time. It's probably all I will own for a long time. I'm not recommending mm -hmm. other people exactly do that. You have to figure out what works for you. And as we talked about earlier, there are definitely people for whom picking stocks is the right strategy for them, even if it's not the best for my wife and I. But mm -hmm. I, I, one, one little quirk I would say is I actually do follow financial news every day. Every day I know what the market did. I read the Wall Street Journal every day because I think it's intellectually interesting. I think it's a fascinating like window into how people behave. But the important thing is that I don't read the Wall Street Journal and then say, I need to go out and buy and sell these specific stocks. It doesn't influence my behavior. I just think it's mm. a fascinating window into how people behave. But um, my, my personal investing strategy is as, as simple and basic as you could possibly be. My entire net worth is this house, a checking account, 
Vanguard funds and shares of Markel where I'm on the board of directors. And that's, that's pretty much it. Mm. And where do you park your cash? What's your, what's your strategy for cash? It's spread out over many different uh, accounts. And actually quite a bit of it is now in treasuries because you can earn a great return there. Spread mm. out over different bank accounts, different brokerages accounts. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, and the, the money that I have in short-term treasuries, I consider that cash. It's, it's all, it's all that, that's cash-like to me. Mm. Got it. Okay, let's move on to your new book. It's called Same as Ever. It covers a lot of the ideas that we've been discussing and much more. So talk to us about why you wrote this book and how it expands on your first book, The Psychology of Money. So Same as Ever is about what never changes over time. It's about, I think in many ways, psychology of money is about the behavior of you, the individual. And Same as Ever is about the behavior of us, the collective. Like, what do we, the collective society, keep doing over and over and over again? And I've always been a student of, I think, two things. One is investing and the other is history. And Mm -hmm. I like the intersection of that, like investing history and economic history I've always been so fascinated in. And one of the things that will really stick out when you're studying any kind of history is it's really interesting to see what, what has changed over time. How do people, what do people used to do that they don't anymore? That's interesting. But to me, way more interesting and way more common is when you see what has not changed at all. And when you're studying the history of Americans 100 years ago or Europeans 1,000 years ago or Chinese 5,000 years ago, you see all these kinds of behaviors that would fit in perfectly today that have not changed whatsoever. So how people respond to greed and fear and uncertainty and opportunity, that is the same today in the United States as it was in any culture a thousand years ago. Mm. And it hasn't changed at all. And because of that, we know that it's going to be part of our future for the rest of our lives. And a lot of why I wrote this book was because I kind of got disgruntled at how bad we were as an industry at predicting what's going to happen next, like predicting the next recession, the next bear market. Nobody can do it. Nobody has any ability to do it. And so with that, you can, do, you can either say, nobody knows anything, don't even try to predict, just no, no one has a clue, just kind of become a cynic about it. Or you can say, okay, we don't know what's going to change, we don't know, but, but we do know what's not going to change. We do know what behaviors are going to be part of our future, regardless of where the future goes. So let's put all of our emphasis on that. And so Same as Ever is 23 very short little stories about little facets of human behavior that I think have always been with us and always will be. And no matter where your future goes or where society's future goes, you know that these little bits that I write about are going to be part of the story. Yeah. I love you have it in your book that you say, if you travel 500 years back or 500 years forward, the world will look much different in terms of technology and medicine and even language. But human behavior doesn't change much over time. So I think that's just, it's so fascinating. It's so true. It, It takes like, I think, thousands and thousands of years for us to like our brain biologically to actually change or evolve. So we're the same human that we were thousands of years ago, even though so much has changed. And one of the things that doesn't go away for humans is risk, right? This is something that we're going to enjoy to the end of time is this concept of risk. And we touched about risk a little bit earlier, but in your book, in your new book, you write, the biggest risk is always what nobody sees coming. So talk to us about these blind risks. Well, there's a, there's a great financial advisor named Carl Richards who has this quote, one of those quotes that just like knock me on, knock me off my feet. The quote is, risk is what is left over when you think you've thought of everything. So you can spend all day trying to predict the next risk in your personal life or in the economy and for society. And that's great. You should do that. But then when you are done with that exercise, the thing that is not on the list is what's actually the biggest risk that you're going to face. So look at like, think about what the biggest risks we've dealt with in the United States over the past couple of generations. Mm-hmm. Pearl Harbor, September 11th, and COVID are probably mm-hmm. the three biggest like societal shocks that we've dealt with in America. And the common denominator of all three of those is that nobody, certainly no ordinary Americans saw those coming until the day that they happened. Mm. You know, and so in all those situations, there was no economic outlook. There was no analyst forecast. There was nobody on the news warning you about these things that in one day utterly transformed the world that you lived in. And so uh, the biggest risk is what you didn't see coming. And the fact that people didn't see coming is what made it dangerous because they were not prepared emotionally, financially, uh, logistically. They were not prepared for these things to happen. So when they hit, it was like 
<laughs> like red alert, what do we do now? And it's always like that. I think in any given year, it is like that. I mean, what's, what is the biggest worldwide news story in 2023? It's probably, I hope it's going to end up, hopefully nothing bigger than it happens, will be Israel and Hamas, will be the biggest story of 2023. And of, of course, there has been tensions, to say the least, in that region for literally thousands of years. But how many people in January of 2023 predicted that that would be the biggest news story? Maybe there were some people who were on the ground and had a greater sense. But by and large, ordinary people watching the news, it was not on the radar whatsoever. Yeah. Same with in 2019, if you were looking at the biggest risk for 2020, nobody said a viral pandemic that's going to close down the schools. Nobody said that. 2001, nobody sees 9-11 coming. You can play that game all day long. And so because of that, you can state with a lot of confidence that the biggest risk over the next year and over the next 10 years is something that you and I and none of us are even thinking about because yeah. it's always been like that. To your point, I'm Palestinian and I didn't even see it coming. I was just right. like, wait, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it's it, 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 like these big stories, they blow you away by surprise. How can we prepare for these risks? If we don't know what they're going to be, how can we prepare accordingly? By definition, you, you can't. And but th that in itself, that realization and that mindset is really powerful in itself because you stop pretending that you can predict. There's a great quote from Nassim Taleb where he says, invest in preparedness and not in prediction. So one way that I think about that is like, think about earthquakes in California. California knows that there is going to be a major earthquake in the future, but everybody also knows that you can't predict when it's going to come. There's no earthquake. There, you, 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 there's, it's impossible to predict what day it's going to happen or what year it's going to happen. So because of that, you're just always prepared. They build buildings that can withstand it no matter when it comes. They don't like, you know, oh, an earthquake's going to come in December, so let's retrofit the buildings then. You're always prepared for it. And I think that's how you should think about economic risks, like recessions and bear markets and job losses. You have no idea when it's going to come. So don't try to think like, oh, well, once you see a recession coming, then you'll start to save money. No, it could, it could happen tomorrow. So always be prepared for it. I think that mm -hmm. idea of like having expectations instead of forecasts is the only way to really survive in that world where risk is what you don't see. Yeah, that makes sense. And another key concept that you talk about in terms of human behavior is pushing too far too fast. Now you say that this is something people do in investing. You say it's also something people do with their companies. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah. Whenever you have something good, you have an investing strategy that works or a company that's going well, the very normal knee jerk reaction is like, great, let's make it go faster. Let's yeah, make let's it milk bigger. It. Let's milk it. Let's push it as hard as you can. You do it with like noble intentions. You're like, I don't want to leave money on the table. If I have this golden goose, let's, let's keep milking the goose. Um, and so it happens all the time. Like in investing, people who are doing well start using leverage or they start making bigger bets, more concentrated bets. In businesses, when it's going well, it's like, let's raise more money and grow faster, 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 faster. And it is such a common story that those investors, those entrepreneurs, or even in your own individual career, you eventually realize that there was a natural speed limit to what you're doing. And if you go over the speed limit, you're going to get in trouble. And you only know where that speed limit is in hindsight when you've gone past it and you get a speeding ticket, so to speak. And so you see this with every successful business. The example I use in the book was Starbucks 15 years ago. And maybe most people don't remember this now, but there was a period in the early and mid 2000s where Starbucks was opening a new store on every street corner, like every couple of hours. It was just like this absolute proliferation of Starbucks stores. And because of it, the quality of the coffee and of the food plunged. They were just they, the company's only goal was to grow, 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 grow. And the mm. quality of the stores just disintegrated. And Starbucks had a really rough period because of that. And in hindsight, they talked about, they're like, look, the natural growth rate that we could sustain the quality of the product, we way exceeded. We pushed it way too hard. And because of that, the business broke for a period of time. And so there's so many examples of that, of like, you have a good legitimate business that is working and customers love you and they will pay you. But if you try to take that and just say, let's try to make it go twice as fast, it's probably going to break. So understanding the natural speed limit and size of whatever you're doing is a really critical aspect of what, what you are doing. Yeah. Any guidance for us to understand like, hey, this is a red flag that I'm pushing too hard and that I should just like calm down a bit with what I'm doing. I think for a lot, I mean, like, let's use the, the Starbucks example. The reason people love Starbucks was not necessarily because it was on every corner. It was because they liked the, 
they like the quality. They like the yeah. quality, they, the food. They like the taste. And once your ability to scale like takes precedence over that, then you know exactly what's going to happen. So mm. understanding, I think this is such a basic comment, but it's so easy to overlook. Understanding why you are successful is the key to doing this. And mm. a lot of people will think like, oh, I'm six, you know, they, they don't actually understand why consumers like them or why their boss appreciates them. And because of that, they overlook what is actually needed to keep this going. And once you have an honest assessment of customers like me because of X, then you realize any deviation away from that. And of course, you're going to lose what made you special to begin with. I think that I, I, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Yeah, I think that's great advice for all the entrepreneurs tuning in. So something else that you talk about in the book is stress. You say that stress focuses your attention in ways that good times can't. Talk to us about why stress sometimes can be a good thing. We look back historically, the biggest periods of innovation and new technology and productivity growth, without exception, happened during periods when the world was on fire, so to speak. Like the most productive economic decade that's ever occurred is the 1930s during the Great Depression, when the economy was a, the biggest train wreck it had ever been. Because every business in America woke up and they're like, if we don't find ways to get more productive and get our act together, we're going to go out of business tomorrow. And that as a motivator, that fear as a motivator creates the most, the biggest productivity boom we've ever had. Mm -hmm. The other was World War II and the Cold War, where it was like, the incentive to figure things out was so extreme because if we didn't, if we didn't figure things out, Adolf Hitler was going to control the world next year. And that kind of incentive created this technology boom of the likes the world has never seen. Like, what do we get out of World War II? We got nuclear energy, rockets, jets, penicillin, microwaves, radar, eventually with the Cold War satellites, all of these things that benefit you and I today that happens specifically because of the stress and anxiety of the war. And mm -hmm. you can maybe be able to say this with COVID in hindsight too, like as tragic and deadly as it is, if it unleashes the scientific boom as it has, that maybe 20 years from now is going to benefit us in ways that we can't even fathom today. Yeah. Like using the phrase silver lining to COVID is a step too far because it's killed like 10 million people. Like I'm not saying like, oh, that's a great thing. But it's always the case that you look back and you're like, hey, despite that tragedy, we got this incredible new innovation because of it that's making life so much better today. So yeah. everybody wants a world in which everything goes great and there's no, there's no uncertainty, there's no, there's no bad times. But like, of course, that, that sounds like a great world. But in that world, the incentive to improve would diminish greatly. And it's mm -hmm. always like the stress that creates the biggest improvements. Yeah, this is I, I love this concept, because it's so true. Constraints, deadlines, like even if you think about your own self, if you know that you have a deadline tomorrow, you're like your your procrastination like releases, and you can just like get your shit done because you know, the deadline is tomorrow, it really helps you become more creative helps you step on the gas in terms of like, completing whatever you need to complete. So what you're saying totally makes sense in terms of like big disasters in the world and how it can actually foster lots of innovation and creativity because our backs are against the wall. We basically have no choice but to get it done now. Yeah, I think I think for writing books, one of the biggest benefits that a publisher provides is a deadline. Mm, <laughs> it's not, it's yep. not necessarily that they're going to help you write the book, so to speak, but they're going to tell you, you have to turn in your manuscript on this date and that that will get your ass in gear. <laughs> mm. Okay, so one of the last ones I'm going to ask you about this book is incentives. So you've got a chapter in it in your book where you quote Benjamin Franklin, who once said, if you would persuade, appeal to interest and not to reason. So talk to us about incentives, what we need to watch out for in terms of how incentives can trick us into doing things that we already know are wrong. I think there are, it's very often the case, not always, this is not black and white, but it's often the case that if you see somebody doing something that you find uh, morally wrong or, or, or just something that you disagree with, you are probably underestimating the odds that you would do that exact same thing if you had their incentives. Mm -hmm. And I saw this firsthand during the financial crisis of 2008, when a lot of Americans rightly pointed at Wall Street bankers and said, those greedy bastard bankers who ruined the economy. And maybe like, that was not necessarily the wrong criticism, but I think what people overlooked is that if you worked at Bear Stearns in 2006, and they said, hey, package these subprime bonds and we'll give you a $6 million bonus. You would have done it too. 
you would have done the exact same thing if you had that incentive dangled in front of your face. Yeah. And so I think we, I think we, we underestimate the boundaries of our morality when we don't understand the power of our incentives. Everyone thinks like, oh, my moral boundaries are right here. But if you had different incentives, you'd be like, oh, maybe I can shift them out a little bit. And you don't even know you're doing it. It's subconscious. Everyone is so influenced by these incentives. And at every level, like, you know, I think it's when you're looking at, you know, World War II, how could the Germans possibly have acted like this? I think when you look into like what, what the 1930s were like for them, the incentives, the incentives to go along with it, the incentives to not want to be an outsider, the incentives to do what you're told, it's not to justify anything in the slightest. But if you were looking for an answer of like, how can people do that thing, whatever that thing would be in business, in wars, whatever it'd be, the answer is usually some sort of incentives. Mm. And it's not, it's, not, it's not even a financial incentive. There are social incentives. There are tribal incentives. There are political incentives to do things that you would other fi otherwise find repugnant, but you do it because the incentives push you to do it. Yeah, that's super insightful. The last question I'm going to ask you about your book in terms of a concept is you talk about permanent and expiring information. And I love the distinction that you draw between these two. And, you know, I hope today's interview is going to be permanent information for our listeners. But can you explain what you mean between the difference of the two? I mean, one, I, one way as someone who writes books, I'd say one of the best advice that I've ever heard is if you want to write a book that people will read 20 years from now, write a book that people would have read 20 years ago. Like mm. make sure that what you're writing about is timeless. And I, I think we can say that about this podcast. I think if we had a time machine and someone listened to this podcast in 2003, 99% of what we said would be relevant. Yeah. And that's always, that's always, so you have to understand what kind of information is expiring, which is like, if you're, if you're watching the stock market, oh, Microsoft missed quarterly earnings by one penny per share. Like that's expiring information. I'm not going to say it's irrelevant, but it's expiring. It has a shelf life. But if you're talking about how people respond to greed and fear, that's permanent. That never changes. And that will be as relevant 20 years from now as it is today. So mm. you should put more of your emphasis in learning permanent skills, knowing that they're going to stick around rather than like drowning yourself in expiring information that might be relevant for a week or maybe even a year, but it has the shelf life of, of, of something that's going to expire. Mm. Okay, I changed my mind. I'm going to ask you one more question since you brought up Microsoft and we've got a lot of entrepreneurs tuning in. So Bill Gates started Microsoft and you talk about this idea of being an optimist and a pessimist. And Bill Gates actually is more of a pessimist. Talk to us about how he's used his pessimism to set up Microsoft for success because even in 2023, Microsoft is a huge company that's growing and leading the AI charge and everything like that. Well, I think Bill Gates is the best example of someone who has gotten optimism and, co and pessimism to coexist. Mm. Because when he started Microsoft in the 70s, he took the most optimistic swing that any entrepreneur has ever taken. When in the 70s, he said every desk in the world needs a computer on it. That was like the most, the craziest idea in the world. Crazy optimism. At the same time, from the day he started Microsoft to the day he left in 2000, he ran it as conservatively as you possibly could. He said he always wanted enough cash in the bank so that he could run Microsoft for one year with no revenue. Like the mm. most pessimistic way to run a business. And so that's, I think that's why they've done so well. It's not that they're always optimistic or they're always pessimistic. They realize that if you can, if you can survive all the uncertainty and all the upheaval, then you have a fighting chance to actually compound for 50 years as they have. Mm -hmm. And very few businesses are actually like that. If you have a very optimistic CEO, they're like, let's bury ourselves in debt and invest every penny that we have and swing for the fences. Yeah. And nine out of 10 of those businesses are eventually going to go bankrupt, probably pretty soon. And, but also if you're too pessimistic, then those businesses become obsolete. So it's getting both of those at the same time that is so rare, but that's really the key to doing well over your entire career, over an entire lifetime, is getting optimism and pessimism to coexist. I totally agree with that. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for your time today. I feel like this podcast was filled with so much timeless wisdom about finances. So I end my show with two questions that we ask all of our guests. The first one is, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to be more profitable tomorrow? Uh, go out of your way to define your game and realizing that your game might be very different from your coworker's game even your co-founder's game, your sibling's game, everyone is different. And don't assume mm. that because society tells you that you should have X, that that's actually what you should be chasing.
Mm, back to the goalposts we were talking about before. What is your goalpost, Young and Profiters? And what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond business and finance. Uh, realizing that there are probably 10 people in life who I want to love me. Mm. My wife, my kids, my parents, maybe three friends. And it's not that I don't care about the opinions of, every, of anyone else, but it's really, I think it's really helpful to have people in your life who you don't want to disappoint. Just a few people who are, it's like, it's, that's, yeah, that's your North Star. And like, am I doing this for the benefit of those 10 people? Or would they be proud of me? Is this going to help my relationship with them? I think it's just a very strong guiding light in order to what, like what really matters. And if you're on your deathbed, are you going to care about your net worth or the square footage of your house? Or are you going to be proud that you are a good spouse? You are a good parent. You are a good friend. You helped your community. Like it's obvious what's going to be more important to you. So like, let's keep that as the focus. Mm, I love that. That's great advice. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for joining us on Young and Profiting Podcast. Thanks so much for having me.